everyone. Today is Sunday, September 9th, and I am playing again for you guys an interview that I did with Eric Bork a long time, about 18 months ago or something like that, something crazy like that. He was my fourth interview, and he was so gracious to say yes to me and to talk with me because he is so much fun. Anyway, today, September 9th, 2001, is the day that Band of Brothers premiered on HBO. So I thought it was the perfect time to re replay this video interview. It's audio. <laughs> and, um, and so you guys can listen to it again because he tells such amazing stories about Band of Brothers and how he got to write Band of Brothers and, and be with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. And I don't know, it was a lot of fun to listen to again. So I thought, why not? We'll just play it on the anniversary of Band of Brothers. And, you know, September 9th, 2001 was two days before September 11th, 2001. And he has a great story to talk about this and the coincidence and maybe not such great luck <laughs> that they had in premiering this that day. But anyway, everyone, here is Eric. Hi, Eric. Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Michelle? Great. Thank you so much for talking with me today. I have so many questions and I could do this whole show on Band of Brothers. I won't, <laughs> but I, I I binge watched it these last two days because I I didn't even realize that I hadn't seen it. But um, it was back in 2001, and I wanted to know: Did you? When did it come out? Was it pre 9/11 or after 9/11? It was um, two days before 9/11. No way. Because that's premiere. all I could think about. Like, yeah, how weird is that? That was when I looked up when it was. I, I couldn't find on Wiki or any of the other websites exactly the day that it was shown on HBO because I, I thought that that would be an important thing. You know, that's what you're, everybody remembers about 2001. So that is very – so it started showing the episodes like right before 9-11 then. That's right. The first one was on two nights before. I think the first two aired as a block, and then the others were every Sunday for the next, like, you know, nine weeks. Well, it was, and um, my oldest two sons went into the service, and um, they were in the Iraq. You know, they were over there during the Iraq War. And um, I asked my oldest son today, who's now 29, I said, did you ever watch Band of Brothers? He's like, Mom, you bought me the box DVD set for Christmas one year. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> 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 I didn't even remember, but I did stay away from war movies for a very long time because of what they went through. And um, after these two days, I, I have been very emotional. It's been, you know, but they are just, like I said, I could talk two days about it. It was great. I've never learned so much about World War II than I learned in these past two days. So it was it was awesome. And and did you, when you were, when you had the book, were you part of turning the book into the screenplay? Yes. Okay. That was my main, uh, my main function was to, was to help, uh, help do that and then, be a part of the production as it as it moved forward from that point on, but it was a long period of development of of taking the the book and interviews and history that 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 uh, a team of us writers and producers had, and gradually figuring out how it was going to be ten episodes and who was going to write which one which ones and then you know I was writing one other people were writing others and um, but uh, yeah it, it was. Uh, not as not as uh, easy and smooth of a process as it might seem. Taking the true history of what happened and what we knew from Ambrose's book and interviews and other interviews done by people from our group uh, to turn that into you know ten one-hour stories was uh, was the kind of the major challenge. And even right up into pr into production and sometimes in editing, we're rethinking how to make some of them work. Yeah, I can't, I, you know, what? that's all I kept thinking about when I was watching it. And, and the fact that it's 15 years later and, you know, I see movies all the time and I'm watching it on my laptop and I feel like I'm there. And I was like, you can't even tell that the, the technology that was used, you know, to get the special effects for that. And I mean, it's, it's current. It's, it's like right up to date, which means that back then it must have been unbelievable, you know, for people who were watching it, uh, you know, it must have just blown everybody away you know I, I like I said I, I don't 
I don't, you know, I didn't watch it at that time, but I also have six children and I was in the midst of raising them at that time. But, um, yeah. you know, I can only imagine the feedback that you guys, I mean, is, and you did win lots of Emmys for it, but I can see why, because it was just as, you know, sometimes you watch old war movies and you can kind of tell that, you know, some of the staging and I, it just amazes me the, the, what you guys had to do to get it to be that lifelike, you know? Yeah, it amazes me too because you know my role was one was one area of it, which was you know writing and kind of creative oversight. Um, but the people that did the production design, for instance, and the visual effects and the music and myriad other things that make it what it is, I also marvel at their work. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, were you there on the set while they were doing it, or was your work already done? Uh, no, I was there on the set as well some of the time. I kind of went back and forth. We shot it in England, and I lived in Los Angeles, so I did a lot of trips back and forth. Wow. Wow, it's crazy. Well, anyway, I, it, it changed me. I definitely texted my son today, and I was like, I am a changed person from this, from watching this. You know, it was it was unbelievable. But anyway, like I said, I could talk about that movie, you know, all day, but I really want to get into um, how I found you. And I found you through your website, uh, which is flyingwrestler.com. I'm always looking for screenwriting websites. And when I came across yours, I was like, this, and I, then I did see that you won awards for it. But your website is, for anybody out there who wants to learn the art of screenwriting, your website just covers it all. It's, it's so awesome. I, you know, I can't thank you enough thank for you. that. As, as somebody who's an amateur, just... I just like it. I love reading books on screenwriting. I love going on people's websites and, you know, just learning about the art of screenwriting. And you just cover, you know, everything with your um, – you have audios and then you have uh, – that you answer questions, you know, blogs that you're answering questions. And, and it's like everything I want to know. And I was like, wow, this is just – this is an amazing website. So I'm really happy that you're getting recognized for it, you know. Well, that's very nice to hear. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you found it that you found it useful, and it seems like it's all everything is there. It's it's been a gradual process for me of just writing blog posts mainly about topics that seemed important and relevant in the scripts that I read as I work with other writers. Um, and so, you know, over time, there's been accumulated quite a lot of those blog posts on various topics, and I try to keep it focused just on kind of instructional opinion blogs. In other words, I'm not blogging about anything else. Every blog post is pretty much just here's my take on, you know, main character point of view and why it's so important or whatever, whatever craft issue. So uh, I don't blog that as often as some, but I, when I do, I try and make it uh, a piece of content that addresses something I haven't addressed before. Yes, and I'm not the only one who says that because everybody leaves comments about how much they love it. So, <laughs> so I know I'm not. But, uh, you know, I when I started reading books on, on screenwriting, I've always been a writer, and I have a blog, and, you know, I bits and pieces here and always thinking I'm going to write a book. Or when I started doing screenwriting, I bought the um, software that they recommended as Movie Draft at the time. I don't know if that's still um, a very – I don't know. They have others, but is that still one that people use? Uh, final draft, right? Final draft. Okay, yeah, final draft. Is that, is that still? Is that uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the most popular. There are quite a few others, but it is probably the most popular one. Yeah, I didn't realize, like, it ha like in order to hand a screenplay in, like, you have to have it in a certain format. You can't just, you know, back in the old school, people just sitting in, at a typewriter and writing it out, and, you know, it has to be a certain way. So I started learning the different things about that, and um, it just – the art of it, as opposed to, like, writing a book, which has its own art in itself, I found that I liked it more because I didn't – because of what you don't have to say, I think, you know, like the details that you don't have to give, I think this is what drew me to it. And so then I started reading books on, and I did finish a screenplay. I mean, you know, it's there, it's done. And it, you know, just because I wanted to go from page zero to 110 and see if I could fill the pages, you know, 
but Mm -hmm. I started to read different things about like what, how to fix it and, and how to do, how to, how to get it for somebody to be seen, which is, you know, kind of why I started doing this show because I thought, you know what, I just get my questions answered and then I'll just talk to people who actually do this. And, and I find out that I actually like just talking to people that do this a lot. So um, I just thought I'd pick your brain about like different things that people who haven't been doing it forever um, don't necessarily know. Like, I read somewhere that to come up with a one sentence log line, okay, that basically if you can get your, your screenplay down to one sentence, then you know that you're getting somewhere, right? And I was like, oh, that seems easy enough until I started doing that. And I couldn't do it. And I was like, oh, no, I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, do you go by that theory too? I mean, do you work on that log line like that? Well, yes, I do. I mean, I've, I was told that in my first ever screenwriting class back in the 80s, and I was skeptical about it, to be honest. Uh, but over over time, I've started to realize that there is a, a lot of truth to that. And it's not so much that, you know, the key is to reduce it to a sentence. It's that you have an idea for a movie that you could say in a sentence and people would get it and find it find it compelling and original and entertaining sounding and, and think it sounds like a good movie. When I say people, I mean people who, who, who work in this field. So, um, I mean, anybody can try to write a sentence that encapsulates what their script is, so, but, but will that sentence be clear and compelling to someone seeing that sentence, like an agent or a manager or a producer who's looking at log lines and, and scripts for a living, and that log line is going to make them decide whether they think they want to read this or not. You know, right. it's not so much about writing the log line as it is understanding what makes a viable screenplay idea and working to develop one <laughs> uh, <laughs> and be expressed in a log line. Right. And it's like, you know, even even the one page that people talk about, well, you know, try to do it in one page, write a page about what, you know, I, I have a hard time with that. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, this isn't just about writing a screenplay and sending it in, you know, this is, a, and, and it's probably a good thing because I think it's a good indication that you really don't know where your story is headed. If you can't do that, is that, am I correct on, in that assumption? Well, it depends. Uh, yeah. Often that is the case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, one, one of the key secrets that, you know, screeners have been doing it a long time or professionals or whatever know and understand is that maybe more so than in novel writing. With a screenplay, it's all about the concept, the basic idea for the story. Uh, and we work on many, many, many ideas to find one that's worth doing. And we work on that one quite a bit before we not only start writing the, the script, but even start writing like an outline. There's a lot of just figuring out what the basic story is and and one of the big learning curves for me and for most screenwriters is understanding what is a story for the screen what makes something a viable story and i I mean i've I've kind of whittled it down to um a big problem with life-changing stakes of one kind or another that a relatable character has and needs to solve and it takes them the whole movie to solve it and it gets worse and more complicated as they try that's kind of, to me, the basics of what pretty much every successful movie is a variation on that. Successful commercial type of American sort of, you know, Hollywood movie or even independent movie. Um, mm-hmm. it, it boiled down to that. And most of, the, most of the ideas that people, including myself in my early days and even now, think would be an intriguing movie or screenplay don't meet those criteria. One, in one way or another, they they fall short. Um, and I should also add, when I say a problem they need to solve, an external problem in their life or other lives of others, not just an internal problem, like they need to heal their beliefs about something. Like that can be going on as well, but there has to be that external problem. The log line is probably going to focus on the external problem, and it has to have, you know, major life stakes. Uh, and it has to be something that they're actively trying to solve throughout the movie, and it has to be defying resolution, even though they're focused like a laser on it. And it also has to be an entertaining process for the audience to watch, <laughs> by the way, whatever that is. Whatever that process <laughs> of trying to solve that problem and reach that goal is, it has to entertain millions of people 
and be original in some way, be not just a carbon copy of something that's come before. So if you put those few things together, those addenda to what I said initially, you have the ingredients, but to fulfill all those is harder than it sounds. Right. Because, you know, back in, you know, before I started really researching screenwriting, I would walk out of a movie and go, I can write that. Seriously. Like, that was yeah. so easy. But I just recently took my grandchildren to see Moana, which is a Disney Pixar movie, their new mm-hmm. one that just came out. And I really understood that with this movie. You know, it was the first time that I really sat there because it's uh, animated and, then, you know, I can kind of just enjoy that part, you know, I don't get so caught up in it, but I really saw that what you're talking about really played out in mo- in, a, in a children's animated movie, you know, like the, the issues, the external, the internal issues that she got into, how she got herself out, you know, it was like, and, and you know that the children, you know, children can't see that. It's just, it's all pure entertainment, but I mean, it was, it was definitely one of those that followed that storyline to the letter of um of some of the books i've read like you know there's one conflict and then there's another conflict and then there's you know it builds and builds and builds until there's this final conflict and then she solves it and she's done and she's you know like it's it was crazy you know i walked out of there like oh i get that i get it it's simple animated movie and i get it what they did and how they get the kids to love her so much you know Mm-hmm. mm-hmm how they get her to be, you know, a Disney princess or whatever she's going to be. But, you know, I, I, I'm i starting to really see that the more I read it. And I'm sure, you know, you could walk in and see that very clearly. But for someone like me, it was like it was such an aha moment to be able to see it right there, you know. Yeah, that's a big part of it, the getting them to love her thing that you said. A big part of it is getting the audience to relate and identify and care about the main character um, I mean, there are some rare movies that have more than one main character that have, like, uh, several stories going on at once, but mostly we're talking about one. And it's not as easy as it looks to get an audience on board with the character and feeling something about them and really kind of getting behind them. You almost become the main character in a way. There's a kind of emotional transference where it feels like what's happening to them is happening to you, and you care about it as much as they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and achieving that is one of the one of the most important and not easily achieved things, I think, in a script. Right. And um, then, you know, and and then there are movies like Allied, um, that's the recent Brad Pitt movie, and you walk out of that movie and you're just arguing with everybody about the ending. Like it doesn't wrap up to an ending that, you know, but then that has its own thing right, doesn't it? Like that has its own appeal too because then people are talking you know it keeps people talking about like what the ending what they think the ending was when it, it's not a clear mm-hmm. ending you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i guess that's I another i haven't seen it yet so it's, it's hard to say usually you do want a pretty clear resolution but obviously there are some films where there are certain things that leave you guessing and yeah i suppose you're right the controversy and the disagreement about that can be can be helpful to a movie's chances, I suppose. Right. Well, the whole thing is whether or not she loves him, you know, and some people are like, yes, she loved him. No, she didn't love him, you know, and they leave Mm. you to decide whether or not she loved him or didn't love him, you know, but it was just interesting to, you know, walk out of there. And I, I, sometimes I get mad about it, but then I'm like, oh, I see why they do that though, because it's, you know, you get to decide, you know, it's, it's up to you then. But um, it's what I also wanted to ask you about, because you do, you know, TV and you do movies. And what do you find is easier? Do you think TV is easier to write for, like a sitcom, or do you think the movie is harder? I would think TV would be hard, you know, as a None of it's easy. (laughs) None of it's easy. (laughs) What I found is every script I ever wrote, it was hard, no matter what it was. Okay. So, I mean, at at one point when I was starting to try to launch a screenwriting career, I was writing features and nothing was happening with them, and I decided I was going to try and write a, a sitcom episode, not even an original pilot, but an episode of an existing show, because mm-hmm. I knew that writers did that to break into television in those days. It's less common now. Uh, nowadays, it's more likely to write an original pilot, but in those days, it was commonly done, and that seemed like an easier thing to do, and in a way, it was, to take a show that was already established that you love and just come up with your own idea for an episode and write that episode. It's still hard to do that in a way that it will stand out, though, and it will make people jump up and down and want to hire you and, and you know, as a writer or represent you. 
but um, uh, so they're they're all hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I can see I see that. I guess you know it, maybe it's an unfair question, but I guess you know I was just like when I watch. Especially nowadays, I mean, with Netflix and Amazon, you sit down just like I did with Band of Brothers. You know, I watched it all in two days. You know, people are liking doing that now. Like, they want to sit down to a series and just, you know, have at it. And and I think that's, you know, I'm like, how would a writer, like, how do you keep it that fresh that people are going to sit there and continue, you know, watch the next one and then watch the next one? And, you know, I would think that that's a very difficult task. Yeah, I think that's the trick is to keep, and it's hard to keep the quality up, you know, episode after episode, season after season, and that's why, you know, it's usually not one writer in television, it's a, it's a staff of writers, one person in charge, but a group of creative minds and, and talented writers generating ideas and, and also beating out the episodes scene by scene, breaking story, as they call it, even if one person goes off and writes the actual script, but even then, it's it's often rewritten, at least polished. By, by the showrunner in the end, so it's a it's a big team effort in most series. Is it that way in movies too, or do you find that it's? I mean, no, is it movies usually tend a team? to be more of a. Oh, okay. Movies are usually not a team. Movies are a solo endeavor. I mean, you might be two people that are a writing team and they write everything together, but other than that, it's just it's one writer, and then they might get replaced, and they often do, and get rewritten by somebody else but there are writers writing in sequence rather than a group together. There, I think the way Pixar does it is a little different where they have a group of people who generate ideas together and support each other, but eventually one person goes off and writes, writes it. But other than Pixar, the traditional method is, yeah, it's just a writer working either on their own or with a producer um, to, uh, to, to write it all by themselves, and then eventually in success, other people get involved and maybe there's rewrites and you're being given notes and feedback and instructions as you rewrite, but you're not writing it as a group. Hmm. Could you ever have imagined, I mean, I know you're from Ohio and I'm from Pennsylvania, so it's pretty close, but I mean, are you living your dream? Like, could you have imagined that this was what was going to happen to your career? Um. Well, yeah. I mean, the the things that that have that have happened, there have been a lot of dreamlike things. You know, mo- most of it was I started working for Tom Hanks as an assistant, and he gave me these incredible opportunities, and those turned into really cool experiences, and gave me the ability to have a career, uh, you know, in the industry. And uh, so, yeah, it definitely has been a dream come true. I would think, you know, I think you. I'm 52. I think you're we're around the same age. I think if I remember correctly, but I was, you know, I'm like, okay, I, I picture you like you show up at the set and there's Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. And, you know, it's like, you just have to be like, okay, yes, I'm here. I'm doing this. And, you know, and they're asking me for advice and <laughs> I, I can I only imagine. <laughs> I'm sure they did, but, you know, I can only imagine that it's just, any any screenwriter, you know, if you if that's what you envisioned as, you know, when you were going through school, that that's what you wanted to be. I'm sure it had to be a very pinnacle, you know, top of what yeah. you thought about, you know. Well, definitely. By the time you get there, there have been all these incremental steps so that no one moment feels like an oh, my God moment because mm-hmm. you've just gradually been getting closer and closer and moving forward into those situations. So that, but but still, even given that, there have been certain moments that were a little bit like kind of pinch me, you know. I'm on a private jet with me, Tom <laughs> and Steven Spielberg. That happened once. That was pretty amazing. Just the three of us. Uh, or I'm I'm even when I was an assistant, uh, when I was just Tom's assistant, he won the Oscars for Philadelphia and Forrest Gump, and I, the next wow. morning, drove the uh, drove the statuette back to the Academy <gasps> to put the nameplate put on it. Those were some highlight moments. <laughs> Yeah, I think those would be very big highlight moments. And and I'm sure, you know, I, I see that you also teach at UCLA, and I'm sure your students, like, that's what they're, you know, they're looking to you and saying, okay, can I? Like, is it possible? You know, can I can I actually get there? And, um, I mean, do you find that, like, when you, you know, when they're asking you those questions, like, do you, what do you say? Like, this is hard, or do you say anybody can do this, you know? Well, it's both, really. I mean, and I work, I work with writers mostly as like a one-on-one consultant or coach, 
uh, but I also teach in a couple different places and and we don't they don't necessarily ask those questions all the time because we're normally focused on a particular thing that they're writing and mm-hmm. the conversation is about that that idea or that script but the reality is it's a very competitive field that the vast majority of people that want to do it never do it professionally or they might do it professionally for a brief time and then are unable to sustain it or have ups and downs which I've had and which most people have uh and um so the reality is that it, although it might look like um, anything can happen, and it can for anyone, and it can um, for most people, it's a long struggle and never quite making money from it uh, if you're viewing it as a profession and a career. Um, but at the same time, some people do, and it's the kind of profession that you get into saying, well, I'm going to be one of the ones that does. Or maybe you don't worry about it, which is probably the best attitude. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say that and maybe get better at it, you know. Right, right. Maybe the thing is is to not focus on where it's gonna lead you because you couldn't have mapped that out even if you wanted to. You know, like I'm gonna be Tom Hanks' assistant, then I'm gonna do this. Like you couldn't have mapped that out yeah. anyway. So I think it's kind of better to True. not think about what can happen from it. Yeah. And I I think of you know I always think that screenwriting is um the harder thing to do only because those are the books I read, but I'd imagine that it's in, in the, you know, in the entertainment business, it's just as hard to make it as a director or an actor or production sure. or, you know, I would think that every single person there has worked just as hard and it's just as um, daunting to look at. You know, I was talking to a, a kid that's in film school and, you know, he's just hungry, you know, like he's 21 and I was, you know, kind of he was doing some short films on YouTube and I was like you know what are you going to do and he's like I'm going to Hollywood you know I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go to LA and then I'm going to get a job you know <laughs> I'm like it's you know but he's in school with a thousand other kids that are going to graduate with him that think the same thing you know that that's what's going to happen and and it's like the you know you don't want to you don't want to discourage but you also want to be like okay so there are just as many of those kids you know and that's one film school as opposed to all the film schools so you know, but I'm sure it's that way with acting schools too, you know? Yeah, definitely. So anyway, but I did want to talk about the services you do um, offer on your website um, because I I think that, you know, screenwriters out there don't really you, – you offer a very unique thing. Um, there's a lot of them out there that say you can send me your script and, I'll, you know, we can we can work on it. But your one-on-one from beginning to end I think is a very unique – um, opportunity for somebody, you know, to, to be able to work with you. And I was reading some of the reviews and those people look like they're, you know, like they changed during the whole process of what they thought it was going to be and to what they got. And, you know, we're so grateful to you. And um, what made you, what made you think of that, of, of going about it in that way? Well, yeah. What you're talking about is what I call my coaching program or development coaching where, um, We'll start with an idea or even a series of ideas, and the writer doesn't know which one is the best yet or which one to write. And I work with them developing it slowly into a first a one page, then a then a four page. We use a save the cat beat sheet often, a story document, then an outline, then a script. Where it's this ongoing relationship where we're talking and I'm reading drafts of all those things along the way. It happened because I, at first I was just doing what most people do, which is read a script and give feedback. And then writers would come back to me with a rewrite of that script months later, and I would often find that it hadn't changed enough, and I felt like they didn't really get or incorporate what I was saying as fully as I felt was needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and it just sort of happened by accident that, that some writers were like, well, can we talk about it uh, as I'm, you know, or I was saying, can we work on it together as you start to figure out the next draft instead of you go off and do it on your own and only come back when you have a full draft. Uh, because it, it gets frustrating if it's just, a, you know, you keep coming back with a full draft and the person says basically similar things to what they said before and it only seems like you've marginally changed it. It can be a little frustrating for both. So some clients, it just started to become that. Uh, and I started to realize that those clients, it was a better process for all. I mean, it's more money because they're, they're, they're getting more of me over more time, but mm-hmm. they end up with something more valuable in the end. And I also enjoy seeing the work get better in a way that I don't really see if I just give notes on a script and then they go off on their own, uh, especially because usually when they come back, the script, like I said, is not 
there's still a lot more work that I feel it, it needs. Um, so I just started turning that into a specific service where I map out a plan of how we'll work together over time, and, and I actually do more of that now than I do just read a script. What, what often happens is people come to me to read a script, and after I give the feedback on the script the first time, then I'll talk to them about the coaching as a possibility, and then if they're interested, and they often are, then we start the coaching, and the first, and we use their their the rewrite of that script I just read as the first thing we work on together, often, and then it becomes ongoing feedback, and it's a lot like what a manager would do. I mean, for a writer these days in the industry, the first thing you want to start to try to break in is you you basically need to have a manager represent you, and then an agent, but first a manager and that's how managers work with clients once they sign you is that they'll read lots of drafts, outlines, they'll listen to your log lines and pitches, and they'll give you feedback over the long term on a project until you finally got into a version that they feel comfortable sending out. It's kind of like doing that same thing for people that don't have a manager yet. Mm-hmm. Well, it does sound, I mean, I think that um, it sounds like a, an awesome way to collaborate and to, re- like you said, to really see it, you know, and, and maybe, and you have had successful ones, right? That way, I mean, some have sold that way through for your um, students. I've had people do well in contests and get representation. I'm trying to think if I have someone where I don't think I've had a specific script that I worked on with them in that way where they actually sold the script. I don't think that's happened yet. I haven't been doing the coaching thing officially for that long. It's only been a year or so, I think. Oh, okay. Um, but. Um, you know, and I, I'm working with writers that are at all different levels. I mean, some of them, it's the first thing they've ever tried to write. So it's very right. unlikely they're going to sell that, even working with me over the long term. Um, so, But different people are at different levels, and there's all these different benchmarks that screenwriters measure their progress by, you know, doing well in a contest, getting signed by somebody, getting people willing to read their stuff, like getting like producers willing to read their stuff or agents. Um, so a sale is kind of like the into the rainbow pot of gold it's you know well again the movie made really is um yeah right i was going to say that i was like i guess actually getting to the movie is the uh you know the ultimate but uh selling it's a pretty good thing too you know well and there are only you know a hundred some screenplays that sell every year out of the tens of thousands of people writing them so to make selling the goal is kind of a recipe for you know, disappointment or frustration because even professional writers, most of the things that they're writing aren't selling. So, um, you know, it's like you said, if you're not thinking about the money and the business side, but you're thinking more about, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to get better at it. I'm going to enjoy the journey is probably the healthier attitude because for most people, it's not going to end up in a sale. It may end up being a writing sample that gets you attention, that gets you someone interested in you who can help you that maybe after your next script, they'll sign you as a client if they're a manager, let's say, or the producer wants to wants to read it and wants to meet with you and see what other ideas you have. Like a lot of times pieces of writing just become samples of what you can do to get you to that next place as opposed to it sells and it gets made and all that, which is so rare. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, I was thinking, like, so do you still have time to do your own screenwriting or are you just more interested in the teaching aspect of it? No, I definitely, I definitely do. I do the teaching stuff part time, and I do my own stuff the rest of the time. So I just finished actually uh, shooting a short film that I wrote, uh, uh, just directed over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, for instance, and I'm, you know, and I'm writing. I'm mostly writing features these days with an eye toward, toward moving into the writer, writer director, independent writer director um, uh, world. Uh, whereas for years I was focused on selling to Hollywood and selling television, especially uh, ideas for series. I was doing that for quite a while and one hour series and then a little bit with half hour series. And I worked on staff on some shows. I've kind of like done a lot of things, dabbled in a lot of things, uh, had some success at some and not as much success at others. And, um, and I kind of, I guess I'm a little restless. I'm always looking for the next way I'm going to approach this, the next, kind of stuff I'm going to write or way I'm going to try to do the kind of things that I want to do. Um, and so, you know, even when you've had professional credits and successes, you're a lot of times redefining yourself and kind of starting over and doing things on spec that no one's paying you for that you hope to later produce or 
sell or you know use to move you forward in some way it's it's it can be a never ending process of uh you know trying something new and feeling like you're a neophyte again or that no one cares again and <laughs> doing it anyway you know well, I think the independent, I mean, the independent film industry is so awesome because I, w- I was talking to um, a screenwriting professor for um, NYU, and we were talking about Doctor Strange and how, like, that, to make a movie like Doctor Strange takes, what, $100 million plus mm-hmm. dollars? You yeah, know, and he was saying, like, probably. that's kind of, like, where, you know, if you're only focused on those, you know, much of their money, if you're only focused on those top companies okay most you know they're sticking a lot of money into a movie like that out of a budget of what they get and then the rest kind of goes to the smaller films but it, it's an interesting age of movies because you can because those big huge movies are out there you know that the, that the kids are seeing and you know i think it opens things up for the independent i always love watching the independent movies that come out and you know there just seem to be more um more dialogue heavy, more story, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As opposed to going and watching, you know, Marvel come out with a, <laughs> you know, not that those yeah. special effects are not, you know, something to behold because they are, you know, it's definitely a ride. But, you know, I, I also I just love watching a good story movie, you know? Yeah, me too. Yeah. So anyway, I'm really happy that you're still writing. It's it's good to hear because you know you've done some awesome work, and um, I'm really I'm really happy to hear that. But I I do want you know to point people to your website because um, again, like there's just everything, and all your services are on there. Um, and anybody who wants to hear your whole story about you know how you did get to become Tom Hanks's assistant, it's on there and. Uh, I, it's you know that's how I found you so I, I really I, I will always keep going back to that to your website for info and tips and and all kinds of interesting things. Well, thank you. I will try to keep it current. I'm always <laughs> getting new things every week, but I will uh, I will do my best. I'm really glad that you and so many people have said that they uh, they that they get value from it. It's very gratifying. Right, and I do think it's still the way to you know. There was a time that I didn't because I, I have a blog, you know, that I did for my kids. And sometimes I think, oh, is it, you know, are those going out? Are websites out? You know, is that is that not the way that – but I really – I still go on them. I mean, I still think there's a lot of, of great websites that provide, you know, uh, things that you're not going to find on any other type of social media that's out there. So I, I really do appreciate it, and I think there are a lot of people that do also. So. Anyway, but it, thank you so much for your time today, and thanks for answering all of my questions. It's been awesome talking to you, and uh, it's, it's almost like a dream for me because I just watched Band of Brothers for two days, and now I'm talking to the guy who, you know, who was a big, huge part of it. So thank you so much <laughs> for for making that happen for well, me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for contacting me and putting me on your YouTube channel, and uh, best of luck with that and with your own writing, and stay in touch if there's anything else I can do. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great evening. You too, Michelle. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.